Hello, I'm Mary Fate and welcome to Cover to Cover. The show is presented by Writing WA and it's our opportunity to meet a West Australian author and hear all about their most recent work. My guest today is Ron Elliott to talk about his new novel, Burn Patterns. Thanks for being here, Ron. Thanks for having me, Mary. I think um, it would be great if we could start with you summarising the plot of your book. Okay, yes, no, I'll, I'll give it a go. And the reason I'm being a little fay is because it's a, a thriller, I don't mm. want to give too much yeah, no away. No spoilers, so, please. Yes. So our main character, Iris Foster, is a retired or just retired uh, forensic uh, psychologist. She used to be the fire lady. Um, and work for the fire department. And she's uh, been dragged, as the book starts, out of uh, her uh, suburban practice to help with uh, what they think is a potential arson attack in a local school. And while she's there, she quickly profiles a couple of students and suggests maybe they didn't do it. But it's the uh, gymnasium's evacuated because they've discovered a secondary device. And on page 16, the school blows up, really, <laughs> and uh, things really get rolling because she's dragged into profiling a couple of uh, suspects of that particular fire. But she also bumps into a fire investigator named Chuck, who's, uh, who's also on the trail of what he believes, uh, what he, someone he calls Zorro, who he thinks is a serial firelighter. And then she meets other police people, etc., and is dragged into the investigation where a number of suspects are, are looked at. And um, I guess the only other thing to say is more and more fires begin to be lit in and around Iris. <laughs> I want to go into the way that you formulated the book a little bit more because when you first started doing your writing, you only had a couple of bare bones of, of what you were thinking. What were they? Yeah, I had, I mean, like a lot of, like a lot of my stories and, and books and, and film scripts, I sort of start with, with half ideas, sort of a couple of years before I end up writing it. And for this book, I, I had, um, I'd always had this, the last story in, uh, in Now Showing was about a family that was targeted um, by a nasty individual who was bringing the family down. It was called Random Malice. And the character in that was an evil man who ended up um, lighting a fire in the house and th with the family in. Mm. And, um, I just wondered about that character and kind of kept nagging at me, this nasty person using fire. And sort of that, that, that mixed with this, my old fascination of fire as a child, as a young boy, nearly uh, creating a few little fires on my <laughs> way to uh, puberty. <laughs> no, well before that I gave up fire lighting. Um, and uh, so I kind of thought of that idea. And I had another idea about um, a damaged, a damaged character who, who was under the delusion that he'd come from Mars. And that, that delusion covered real damage in his life. And I kind of thought those two characters could mix together in a really interesting way. Mm. So that's what led me to the whole idea of fire and the perpetrating of fire as, as kind of delusion, but as kind of evil, evil versus damage. Yeah, so the evil that men do and the Martian character were the, were the two bare bones. And then you also did a lot of research around post-traumatic stress yeah. disorder. Yeah, yes. Well, what, what came of that was I, I, I sort of had, had my potential suspects perpetrators of a crime and I decided that if it were damaged individuals, I needed a psychiatrist, a psychologist to explore that. And so that's when I came up with the idea of Iris, Fo the, the beginnings of Iris Foster. And I thought, well, what, how would she get a job in the fire department? So I was just being logical, like how would she get a job? And I thought, well, as a psychologist, she might deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. So I, I, that led me to some research where I discovered that, I mean, I was, I was really surprised that um, paramedics and, and firefighters have some of the highest levels of post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and then came police people. So all these things that we knew about 
from way back in the First World War in Vietnam about post-traumatic stress yeah. disorder in, in soldiers was now being repeated in service industries. And, and that, that led to these other kind of um, discoveries about post-traumatic stress that, um, for instance, um, I didn't realise that often heroes who, who, who have gone and rescued people from, from violent situations then suffer from post-traumatic stress afterwards and need to be cured. Yeah, no one really thinks about what happens after, do they? Exactly, and, it's all, and it was all these people who were helping. Yes. So the helpers were the ones who were suffering. And, and to some degree, it's only just being, rec it's being well talked about now, but, but their need for that. And that also led me to uh, the, the discovery, and it makes complete sense, of, of rape victims also mm. suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. In the sense that they, and what you mean by that is that, that they suffer similar symptoms? Absolutely. Des despite what the experience has been for them? Absolutely. The, um, the same sets of symptoms of dislocation. I'm, and I, I want to say, I'm not an expert. Like I start to sound like a five-minute expert on this stuff that I've researched, and I'm not. So, mm. but I, but, but the symptoms that, that a soldier suffers from are exactly the same symptoms that uh, a rape victim yeah. can suffer from, can suffer. Because the whole thing with post-traumatic stress disorder is some people don't. Some people can be in the First World War in a trench and walk out the other side and they're unaffected. But, but most people, if you keep repeating trauma, they will eventually crumble. Mm. The, 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 the mind eventually goes, look, this is, we're out of here. <laughs> and we should point out here that it's, it's Iris who has post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, that, that was kind of a late discovery of me when writing it, that, that I thought, here she is, she's left forensic psychology, she's got into clinical psychology to help people rather than catch criminals, um, because there's been an awful event in her recent past where, where someone she profiled targeted her practice and burnt it down, um, killing her secretary. Mm. So she's suffering from these things and trying to get away from, from clinical, uh, to clinical psychology. And as she, you know, she's trying to heal herself while she's being dragged through, while kind of she's getting more trauma pushed her way, I think. Mm. So a lot of the story is really central to it is Iris's journey to her own recovery. And I think in, in parts of the novel, we explore not only her family, her daughter, her husband, but her, her relationship with her mother. And it gets all, you know, it's a psychological thriller, but it's about psychology as well. Yeah. And it's interesting because I know you did a lot of research, not only mm. on post-traumatic stress disorder, but on narrative therapy, on pyromania. But then I read in the epilogue that you were, you were thanking people who'd actually helped you with the authenticity of the story. And one of those it, one of those elements that I wondered about reading it was where Chuck, the the investigator who you, you mentioned before, is recounting a very traumatic experience that he had of of rescuing people from a fire situation. It, was that the kind of thing that you needed to tap into someone's experience for? No, I mean strangely enough, I, I mean I a whole thing of. The whole thing about arson investigation, um, the forensic of arson and, um, and uh, firefighting were all things that uh, I explored, but I found on the internet lots and lots of training videos that for firefighters around the world. I mean, you basically you're in there with them learning how to fight a fire mm -hmm. in, in fiery buildings. They recreate everything. Um, I, I watched Backdraft. I read, I read heaps of books by firefighters, by arsonists, by, you know, Joseph Warmbaugh uh, did a book on a guy named Orr who wrote a book about points of origin and he turned out to be a serial arsonist. So he wrote this book yes. and they tracked it back to him. So I, a lot of research on that, but, but I think I just, I just, I think writers have the capacity to ingest research and then imagine yourself being in the situation. So once, once the firefighter was in a building that was burning down and they had to explore it floor by floor while it was burning down, there's stuff on all that in the interweb, as I call it. Mm. There's stuff out there and it's visual, it's written, etc. 
So I did that and I wrote that scene as a, as a really powerful scene on its own right. But then uh, when I'd written the, the novel, I, uh, I managed to find an arson, a local arson investigator and firefighter and said, is, is this, what have I got wrong? Is it true to yeah, life? Yeah, is yeah. It, is it, or is it too Hollywood? Because mm. that's, I think that's, that's the thing I found as a filmmaker that so many of our experiences as readers and, and, um, and, and viewers is some of our experiences are now modified by all the films and books we've read. So some things, like, you know, I've, I've been involved in a film, the last third set in a courtroom, uh, a feature film, and, um, and there's no way you would make a 90 minute film set in a courtroom mm. that would occur in half an hour. It's days and days of dross I mean, a real court, I mean, it's important experiences for the people, but there's just so much boring yeah. detail that we gotta get past. Whereas your, I mean, the whole book actually has great pace. That was one of the things that I, I noticed as I went through it, you know, that, that it, it's certainly, you're obviously very mindful of that, not getting stuck anywhere. Yes, and I, and, but I th also think it's, um, I also think you do, if you do two years of research, you want to put it all on the page. You want to go, look, mum, I did all this stuff. Look <laughs> yeah. at my homework. And, and I'm just reminded of uh, it's science fiction films. There's a science fiction comedy film where, where someone, someone pointed out that, that when we go to a light switch, we just push the switch and a light comes on. We don't stand there explaining electricity for five minutes. We just move on. And I think that's one of the things that that all the redrafting you do in, in a novel like that is often taking out that research because, because people don't walk into a room and say, well, actually, I blah, 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 blah and, and do their whole medical degree in front of you. They just move on. Mm. And I think, but, but I think the, the key word um, that I've heard recently about crime writing, which I really like, is plausible. I think Alan Carter said it in yeah. one of your previous... It needs to be plausible for the reader to believe those people are real. Mm. And so it needs to have that clout. But a lot of it is layering it in there, I think, and then taking and it then out. And then taking it back out. Yeah, yeah and but it's th the residues stay in there. You know, the way psychologists talk to patients and to each other, mm. there's, it's like the legal profession, it's like doctors, they all have a, a jargon. And, and almost rhythms of talking that you try and keep. Yeah, and that actually interested me uh, in terms of the character James, who, who is the, the Martian, mm. or who believes himself to be, uh, um, was that I was, I pondered a few times during the book about how you were able to predict the way that he might behave, you know, because that he was he was mentally unwell. Mm. Um, mm. And, and I thought you did that with, uh, you know, with great, um, plausibility actually mm. how did you manage that yeah I, I think it was a combination of things I think I think partly I did I did my reading research like I, I read a lot about of the novels about split personality mm. I never promised you a rose garden was one of them the three faces of Eve so I kind of looked at that Shutter Island mm -hmm. was another one that occurred to me but but also um, my, my dad was sick for a long time. He had uh, schizophrenia mm -hmm. when I was young. Uh, well, he had it uh, his whole life. Um, so I think I picked up how, how some people think and I've known people who've, um, who've, who've had nervous breakdowns and things. So I think I picked up the rhythms. Of, yeah, you've uh, become attuned to that. Yeah, that and I think you're not, even yeah, you're not even aware of it and you're aware of how, I think you become aware of how quickly people can move from, from, some, from resting states and happy states to suddenly flighty states mm. or suddenly protective states. But, you know, and, and I think a lot of people have our little protections and our little mannerisms and all those things. So it's, it's, uh, it's but I, I just think it's there. I think I'm just used to seeing that. And if, it's if, it, if his character was believable to yes. you, then, then, then I say I must be working. Yeah, yeah. I was interested to know if in writing, it struck me that sometimes when the police investigators were looking at certain aspects of the behaviour of arsonists, that there's a certain kind of admiration in the way that they talk about, you know, when they're unpicking the arsonist strategy. And I wonder whether you, it had crossed your mind that 
there's a fine line between pulling it apart and glorifying it in some way. Yeah, no, it's, that's it's an interesting question because I think the same. I think Iris admits to herself that when she first became involved with the fire department, that that there were all these fine, strong men who were brave fighting fires, and and her whole being so close to the power of fire the attractiveness of fire, the destruction of fire. There's a kind of magic that she found herself drawn to. Mm. And, and I think, I think, I think the police, I think the police when they're pulling something apart, certainly Chuck, Chuck's character is, is, is tied up to his ego. And so his ego of finding the, who, who lights a fire, and, and also my research about what they have to do, like they go in, this buildings that they go into are not only burnt to smithereens, they then had firefighters come and pour water on it, mm. trash it because they're tearing down walls to try and save lives and stop the fire, and then pour more water on it. And these people come in straight afterwards and try and work out where it started. Mm. And they do. And they, the, the points of origin, the way fire spreads, the burn patterns, where they find out where it started and therefore can work out how it started, is fascinating. Mm. But, but, it's, but it's very much like crime investigation. That's, that's when I just started thinking about crime investigation per se. And, and because two, two things about that, I think, in this novel. The first one is because this event happened in a school and there was an explosion, it's not just a serial killer investigation. There's a terrorist investigation going on. There's a national investigation. It, it, we live in the world we live in now th that when something happens, no one knows where it's coming at us from anymore. It could be anything or it could just be someone who's, who's, who's angry. You know, it, it, so when you start one of the pleasures, it seems to me, about reading a crime novel is it's all worked out at the end. Mm. <laughs> and when we live in the world, none of it's worked out. We don't know what the hell is going on. A and so, so that was one of the elements. And the other in element was because I tr chose to tell the novel from only Iris's eyes, suddenly those other pieces of the investigation only come by her like, like a ship passing by or yes. another car passes by and you realize, oh, there's an investigation going on there about this. Oh, this is about, mm. you know, there's a moment where she's talking to the detective, Pavlovic, mm. and, um, and uh, she, uh, she realizes she's, oh, you're doing miscellaneous. You're doing miscellaneous and crazy people, aren't you? And it's like, she just realises he's not part of yeah. that investigation. She's part it of a is different investigation. It is interesting the way you handle that about the way that uh, the way that she manages to piece things together in surreptitious kind of ways. Because uh, you know you've obviously had to figure that out mm, as, mm. Um, with her as as the the narrator almost. So um, uh, one of the th other things mm. that I thought um, you did beautifully in this book was um, keeping suspense for just uh, uh, the right amount of time. And my example if I hope it's okay to say, is um, about Iris being a suspect at what, one, one point. Um, and the, um, the amount of time that you were able to hold that and then let it go felt absolutely perfect to me. And I wondered about the art of writing suspense. Yeah, I have no idea about that. <laughs> I, no, I don't. I've vibe. thought about it. Yeah, <laughs> it is the vibe, but it's, uh, maybe it's from filmmaking, maybe it's from reading, but it's, it's I mean, A, I, a, I think, um, I think there's a lot of suspects in this book and so there are a lot of people who could have done it mm. and so therefore there are very valid reasons for you to suspect a whole pile of people and Iris is one of those people and uh, but I think I'm just wondering whether it's filmmaking where you just you cut and you cut and you cut until I started life as an editor, you know, a thousand years ago, and you, you keep cutting it shorter and shorter until you've cut it too short, and you go, put, that, put, put those frames back in because you've cut it too... I think that's the same. I also think you care about some of the people in this book, and I think that's partly what suspense is about, yeah. that, that you actually care what happens to this person. You know, like, I, I hate... I'll probably lose a lot of friends here, but I'm so over comic books 
movies at the moment because I just don't care about Thor anymore. <laughs> I just <laughs> don't care about like you're gonna you're gonna trash another street of Hollywood and you're gonna save the world again. And I'm so bored with it. Yeah. Like so, I think it's about where where um, sissy space. I, 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 anyway, I won't get on to other films, but there's films that are quite small films that you that you equally. Mm. Um, I think I, I, I sort of get the sense with, with the editing process that it's it's almost it's almost like music in a way, isn't it? That it has that sort of um, it, there's a there's a, a point at which there's a satisfaction to where the music changes, and I think it, it it's the rhythm and and the pace of the whole thing that you've just yes. managed to get that yeah. right, really well calibrated in this book. Well, thank you. Yes, yeah. I have to ask you about the setting. This has been a really important element of mm. burn patterns for mm. me. Because I had an in-depth discussion with one of my colleagues at Writing WA uh, about, I said, where's it set? And she said, well, obviously it's set in Perth. Mm -hmm. and, and I felt like an absolute idiot because I had missed all of those clues. Um, and then when I went back and, and re-looked at some of those clues, they were certainly there. But I still felt like it was fair that I'd missed them. What happened? What happened to me <laughs> that I, I missed those clues? I, yeah, I, I think you're both right. I, I said it in Perth when I wrote it. Um, most of the places and buildings are, are places. There was a Hakia prison. There was a Franklin out at Greylands. There, and, and, I, and I visited some of those places. Um, but then I decided that I wanted to widen it. Um, a, a couple of reasons, and I'll go to another book as an example. Mm -hmm. I, my first book was called Spinner, and it was set in Dalwollanu. I'd grown up having the weather done in Dalwollanu, and I wanted to set it in Dalwollanu. And it's in 1920. This this orphan lives in Dalwollanu, and he travels to Perth. He walks back to Dalwollanu at some point. He travels to Melbourne and gets in the Australian cricket team. Um, and it was Dalwollanu all the way until about I needed a river for him to irrigate his fields and get a really strong wrist from irrigating the fields mm -hmm. and Dalwollanu didn't have a river that and so I just changed the name and I made a great discovery that now my town had a river now my town had the war memorial exactly where I wanted it and suddenly I was freed up and, and so the same the same started with this book in terms of I didn't know whether Hakia had an observation wing. I didn't, I, of course it does, and of course it has a safety area, and of course it has a place um, to look at uh, mentally um, damaged people. Mm. But I wanted a perspex glass, and I wanted certain things to make the scene work. And so I just started, I just started letting Perth go. I just started going, well, Perth's similar to lots of other medium-sized cities. And um, I mean, the other one, the other reason, the other reason some, someone in Sydney um, did a review of a, a West Australian film where there was a serial killer. Um, and it was a sort of comic film. But the Sydney reviewer started their review by saying, it's hard to believe that a small place like Perth could have a serial killer. Mm. And you just go, what? Yeah, you don't want to be hamstrung by something as yeah, petty so, as but, that. But something is wrong-headed. Mm. You know, uh, I'm sorry, we've got as many serial yeah. killers as anybody else. We, no, it's, I mean, it's a awful thing to say, but it's like that idea. So it wasn't just an idea of uh, people in Perth maybe letting go exactly where the doorknob was in a room or where you might yes. go from one place to another, which people can, can get um, quite concerned about. But it was this idea from outside that, look, this is a medium-sized city mm. where things happen. But it was even things like where Iris notes that James's accent was Australian. My interpretation of that was that therefore she wasn't. You know, oh, okay. So it was little yes. things like that. But I went back and I thought, no, no, I, I think I've been fairly tricked here. <laughs> Well, but, but because he was Anglo-Indian and because there was a terrorist area to it, I thought yeah. it was a valid thing for her to say because 
he doesn't have a Malaysian accent, for instance, mm -hmm. which is quite that's that's a it's a clue rather than a uh, yeah. But also, when my fire in, real fire investigator read the read the novel and he was mainly concentrating on certain scenes, he, he said, "Oh, and you move it to America halfway through, don't you?" And it's like, no. <laughs> I, I feel so much better now. Yeah, yeah. So I intentionally tried to blur that. And it's interesting because um, at, at what, Iris loves butterflies and, and mm. at one point she ends up in the butterfly enclosure at the zoo and that was one of the reasons why you depersed it too, wasn't it? Yeah, I, when I first found her, some of the heart of her character, I, there's research you do about narrative therapy and psychology and all those things but then there's this other thing about someone's family and where they're from and what are their experiences and she's quite tough but at the same time she's quite soft and delicate and it was when I when I remembered visiting the butterfly house in Perth Zoo I went oh that's it she would visit the butterflies that is such a it just it kind of it was just an image that resonated beyond her but it started with it with their delicacy it started with everybody's mind and and our and who we are our soul being kind of like a butterfly, I don't mm. know. That's what I thought. So, um, so then she visited the butterfly enclosure, and, and pretty, some pretty important incidents happened there too. And I went, "Oh, there's no butterfly enclosure here now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's ruined so, everything." Yeah. <laughs> so again, just wafted past. But no, it was interesting. We talked before about the whole image of the butterfly mm. stuff, and you made me think about it some more and go, "Oh, yeah, there was a whole pile of different." reasons why this happened and and then and then once it happened then other parts connected to the butterfly could start coming out so yeah i think that's almost as much about the writing process that once you find something then other things start happening around yeah. it mm. and also the fact that you uh and you we were talking about clues before and about how sometimes you know that you'll lay clues and certain people will pick them up and others will read the book five times and never pick the clue up. So what's the satisfaction for you in someone picking up a clue and, and, and presenting it back to you? Oh, well, I, the reader is the only person, especially the readers who don't know you, are the only people who can tell you whether that worked or not. Yeah. Um, the, the girlfriend of one of my nephews read it in three hours, she's a bit of a prodigy, and said, oh, I, picked the, I picked the murderer straight away. Oh. It's like, oh, so I was very disappointed <laughs> in that. <laughs> so I was disappointed in that. Yeah. But other people, have, other people have said, I thought it was this one. And I thought it was this one, mm. which is, you know, um, which is very satisfying, I think. And, and, and in terms of some of the people, it was the last draft where I took out a little bit more. Because I thought, oh, t people will get this, and 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 added certain other things for other people. Um, so, so I think that process continues. Mm -hmm. But I, but I also think, and and I have asked a lot of people. Iris's character is she's such a great person. I really, I really like her, um, and and her journey to her wellness, and her journey dealing with her own inner issues and her own mild craziness, potentially big, it is a really satisfying journey. So mm. the crime and solving the crime is, is only just one part of it. And, and also, as it turned out, I think exploring all the damaged people, including those in law enforcement and those people, I thought that was I hope that that's as, as satisfying in the journey. So it is a, a thriller, but there's other stuff going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Will we be seeing Iris Foster again, do you think? I, that's, that's starting to crop up in reviews, <laughs> <laughs> including the review on the weekend in, in, in the Oz, that people are going, look, this is really good, but when will we see Iris again? So I can't say, because she'll have to get out of prison, won't she? It's classified, in yeah. other words. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about your West Australian book recommendation. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Um, what are you recommending well, for us? Well, if I lean forward here and get out of focus for a second, I'm recommending The Good Parents. Um, yes, Joan London. Joan London. Yeah. Um, what she, did you love about this book? I mean, firstly, she's a great writer. Um, she just from, I reread the first page on my way in, in and, and just 
remembered that I felt in good hands. Mm. I felt like I was with someone who knew how to, how to describe life and inner life. But I think I also, as a parent, as, as, as hopefully a good, good parent, um, a lot of it um, sparked uh, things in me. Um, their teenage daughter is living in Melbourne and the parents go to see her as has been arranged, but she's not there. Mm -hmm. And we follow her and her young life in some kind of, maybe jeopardy, maybe not. But when the parents are put under stress worrying about her, we look back into their lives. And we see that when they were teenagers, they experienced things that were, they made decisions that were quite perilous. Mm. And that makes you think we all make those decisions when we're, when we're teenagers. I can think of all, hundreds of things, including a motorbike, including things I did, people I went with on the spur of the moment. And, and then when you're a parent, you're telling, you know, my oldest daughter, don't get a motorbike, <laughs> just don't yeah. get a motorbike. Please, and in, Dad. And in the yeah. end, you just have to go, yeah. I, I'm shutting up because I had a motorbike and I wrecked it a few times. Yeah. And, 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 I, and that's one of the, only one of the elements of, of this book is that exploration of who we are now and who we were and the way some cycles are repeated in different ways. Mm. I think Joan London deftly explores humanity, doesn't she? Oh, and that's the other thing. She yeah. says it, it's a book full of wisdom. There's so many moments where you go, ah, oh, yes, I wish I had have thought of it that way. Yeah. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's a wonderfully wise book. Mm. And, and for me, I brought it in because when I, that, that, the year I read this book, it was one of the best books I read that year. I don't care where it came from, and I know you asked for a Perth book, but a West Australian book, but it was just flat out one of the best books I'd read that mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Ron, thank you so much for writing Burn Patterns. It was a really compelling read, and I will be reading it with different eyes, obviously, next time mm. I read it. But thank you so much for joining me on Cover to Cover. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Writing WA has created book club notes for Burn Patterns and for all the other books we featured on the show. You can subscribe to our book club e-newsletter and receive them direct to your inbox each month. Or you can download them from the For Readers section of our website at any time. If you don't have a local bookshop where you can buy the books featured on the show, you can order them from Crow Books in Perth. When you place your order by phone, mention the code cover to cover and you'll get the postage free. Next month on Cover to Cover, I'll meet Sam Carmody, a writer and award-winning musician from Geraldton. We'll discuss his debut novel, The Windy Season, a fierce, evocative and memorable story set in a wild and inhospitable fishing village on the central coast of Western Australia. We love receiving your feedback about Cover to Cover. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please use the email address shown on the screen. Thanks for joining me again this month. We hope you're enjoying hearing about great new books by our wonderful West Australian authors. If you have writers in your communities in need of support or advice, then please put them in touch with us. I look forward to your company next month on Cover to Cover and in the meantime, enjoy reading local.